Welcome to Dementia Friendly Prince George's County, Maryland, Northern Sector Webinar Series for Caregivers. Today's topic is Effective Communication Strategies by Michael Smith, sponsored by Prince George's County Government and Department of Family Services. This evening we're going to be talking about effective communication strategies. Uh, and I know as our loved ones progress through uh, Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, sometimes it can be very problematic in understanding what they're saying when they're still able to verbally communicate. And unfortunately, as the disease progresses, they're not able to effectively verbally communicate and they start using shorter uh, sentences, one words, and it even gets to the point that they're not communicating with words at all. It might be truly nonverbal or gestures, things of that nature. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk indeed, particularly about what we're hoping to cover in this evening's program. So what we're hoping you'll take away this evening is an understanding of explaining the changes that you'll see throughout the course of the disease in your loved ones, being able to decode the verbal and behavioral messages that are delivered by someone living with dementia or Alzheimer's and responding in ways that are helpful to that person. And then finally, identifying strategies that you can utilize to connect and communicate at each stage of the disease. So let's move on to the next slide. And as we're talking about communication, communication again is not just about words. As an example, what I am actually literally figuratively saying right now, it's also about what's being communicated non-verbally. If we can pull up the full detail of the slide. It's the tone of our voice. It's our body language. Are we looking at our loved one when we're talk talking to them? Uh, are we uh, expressing a sense of care and concern and love in a non-judgmental way? Uh, how are our facial expressions? Are we showing a sense of care and concern or are we being very angry and demanding and our voice is getting louder? And, that sort of thing. So all of that's a part of communicating, both in terms of how we are communicating with our loved ones and as they're communicating with us. And again, unfortunately, in the progression of dementia or Alzheimer's, their ability to communicate will be diminished. And it's up to us to better communicate and understanding their nonverbals, their body language, what they're expressing, uh, even in their gestures. Uh, gestures can also be a form of communication. Let us now move on to the next slide. So let's talk briefly about the various stages that happen uh, as uh, progression of dementia or Alzheimer's goes about. Clearly for our loved ones, their ability to communicate their thoughts and feelings through words, unfortunately, again, will diminish. They'll lose the ability to understand words and they'll lose abilities to express words. However, they do maintain a sense of themselves, meaning they have a sense of who they are, and it's important to be respectful and mindful of that. Connecting with the person's self is key to effective communication. And one of those ways of doing that, and we'll talk in more detail momentarily, is connecting emotionally with our loved one. In the early stages of the disease, it may just be a few noticeable changes. Maybe they are not remembering a particular word. Maybe they are taking a few moments, a few seconds, if you will, to recall a particular word. Uh, so you may want to even ask them in the early stages of dementia or Alzheimer's, gee, I, I notice sometimes you struggle to, um, okay, I see you're having trouble. You want me to give you a few minutes? Yeah, what I was trying to say is, or... Oh, you're thirsty. Okay, I'll open that bottle for you, that, that sort of thing. So giving them that opportunity to, again, be self-efficient on some level. Unfortunately, in the middle and late stages of the disease, uh, particularly in the middle stages, they may use basic words. They may use one or two words to express something. They re relay on their own tones of voice uh, or facial expressions. And so you're interpreting, if you will, are they grimacing? because they're in pain? Are they grimacing because maybe they have to go to the bathroom? Uh, that sort of thing. 
Uh, but throughout the process, it's important to communicate and connect with them in an emotional way. And then finally, in the latter stages, the late stages, uh, they might be able to respond to familiar words. They may get a word out, uh, but uh, more than likely they can't communicate. But at that stage, and we'll talk more about this too, through the various senses, sight, sense, sound, those sorts of things, maybe playing music or songs will help connect them. Uh, using body language and the five senses will help them feel a sense of connection. You're able to say something to them and through their nonverbals, the sight, sound, smells, that sort of thing, they're able to share something that they're hoping or wanting with you as well. So let's move on to the next slide. As we're talking about the early stages, here's some of the changes that you might notice. Finding uh, the correct word. So again, they might not be able to say, um, I want to go to the bathroom or I'm hungry. They may just point to something. You might be in the kitchen and they're pointing at the banana. Um, or they may be holding themselves, you know, their stomach, and that might be an indication that either indeed they're in pain or maybe they're needing to go to the bathroom. Clearly, uh, some of the things we'll notice in the early stages, because again, they can't process. It's not that they can't hear, uh, but they might not be able to process multiple conversations uh, or even multiple phrases within a single conversation. And so they're withdrawing. They're not saying as much. They may even, if there's many people in the room, they may actually walk out of a room because it's too overstimulating to process three or four people talking and what, okay, what did this person just say? What did that person say? What, what do I want to say to this person? What, you know, so it gets really baffling and overwhelming, if you will. Moving on to the next slide. And here's an example as we hear from a loved one. We're not able to hear the sound, Mr. Watson. Okay, let's see if we can bring that up. If not, we'll we'll move on. we can't pull up, this is Ms. Tierney. She's an associate director of volunteer research programs with the Alzheimer's Association. And some of the points that she would be making, if we could hear, she's talking about how caregivers may struggle to know how to help their loved one uh, in the early stages. And so again, you might feel frustrated sometimes. You may think, let me quickly fill in the blank and just say, oh, this is what you want. That's what you're trying to say? and you can hear it in my voice, it sounds so judgmental. Uh, it might even sound belittling. What is it that you really are trying to say? What, what, what I can't, you know. So we, we don't wanna come at our loved ones with that level of tone. Again, in the early stages, you may wanna ask your loved one, how do you want me to help you to communicate? You want me to give you a few minutes for you to recall the word, uh, or you want me to help you fill in the blank, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and by showing that you're asking them their preferences, you're deferring to them and showing them a level of love and respect and dignity that they deserve. So you have the sound on, Mrs. Smith. You want to move on to the next slide then? We can play it. Go ahead. Communicating in the early stages of dementia with the person with the disease is important. Um, at that time, you still have language as a tool. So you can learn things about what they might prefer as the disease progresses. Uh, for example, as the disease progresses, a person might have difficulty finding words. Caregivers often struggle to know what to do in that moment. Early on in the disease, you can ask. You can say, you know, if you ever have trouble coming up with the word, would you rather that I jump in and give you the word, or do you want me to wait and allow you some time so you can find it on your own? Okay. And moving on to the next slide then, communicating again in the earliest stages, again, asking directly how you can be of help with communication. 
it's important that you keep your sentences clear, simple, and straightforward. You know, do you want a glass of water uh, or do you want tea, as an example, versus what is it that you want to drink? And they're sitting there thinking, um, hot. And you're saying to yourself, what, what, hot what? You want hot water, hot tea, hot coffee? And again, if you've asked them earlier, how can I be of help? They may say, give me a few minutes. And so you're saying, okay, and they're saying hot, hot, hot coffee. I want coffee. So you now have given them a chance in the early stages to be able to express what they want. And that's wonderful. They're still communicating. But it's important, again, to keep your sentences simple and straightforward um, so that communication between and amongst you and your loved one can be simple. Um, and also, it's important to include the person in any conversations. And what we mean by that, and I uh, have shared previously, and I'll remind those who have joined us previously, as well as those who are new to the conversation this evening. My late wife uh, had Alzheimer's at the age of 53, passed away at the age of 62. Uh, and on occasion, clearly, when we'd go to the doctor, particularly one new neurologist, Rather than talking to Mrs. Smith directly to say, Mrs. Smith, how are you doing this evening? How are you feeling? Do you have any troubles? She would direct all her questions and conversation to me as if Bernita, that was my late wife's name, as if she were not even in the room. Um, so again, it's important that we try to include our loved ones, speak with them, speak with them with humility, speak with them in sentences that are clear and straightforward. Let's move on to the next slide. Some other things we can do in the early stages, again, avoid making assumptions. If we can, ask them what they would like. Speak directly to the person. Look them straight in the face. Uh, have eye contact, that sort of thing. Communicate in a way that is most comfortable for the person. Uh, you know, what are their options? Uh, if you want them, if they are saying to you, at this point, can you leave me some sticky notes? Maybe leave me a voice message, that sort of thing. Uh, find the humility and lightness in the moments, even though it may be stressful as a caregiver and difficulty for those who have different forms of dementia. So in those light moments of brevity, uh, there is both humor, uh, and it's important to understand that and being able to laugh at it. Um, and also be honest with yourselves and your loved one. I know it's difficult. I find it difficult sometimes trying to figure out what you're saying. But you know what, love? I'm here for you. I'm going to be patient. Um, give me some cues. And maybe you might want to help. Again, showing them a picture of a bottle of water. You want something to drink, that sort of thing. So that can help uh, with a sense of being connected and allowing them to feel that you're connected to them and allowing them to be able to share with you what they can as best as they can at that stage of the illness. Moving on to the next slide. In the middle stages, let's talk about some of the changes that you might notice. There might be increased difficulty in finding the right words. There may be uh, instances where they're losing their train of thought or they're actually not speaking as much as they used to. They may be communicating now through actual behavior rather than more words. So they may, again, be pointing at something. Uh, they may be getting up and pounding on something, meaning, you know, is it that they're trying to be heard by saying, listen to me, even though they're not saying anything, or that they're expressing uh, a sense of frustration because they can't get the word out? And we'll talk about this in a moment, but being able to say, I know it's frustrating. You can't go outside like you used to, or you can't drive, or that sort of thing. Uh, if you're finding that there's any major sudden changes in their behavior or functioning, please be in touch with their healthcare provider, with the doctor as soon as you're noticing any major changes or sudden changes. That's important. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And here's another video, I believe. I would advise couples, and I usually do advise the caregiver who comes to the group and is caring for a spouse, that you take your time always count to three before you respond. 
because it gives you time to think about your answer and what's going on. Generally, in a marital dispute, it's quick, it's back and forth. You're quick to give an answer. When they've been diagnosed, to sit back and say, okay, you're supposed to be the one that's reasonable here. Let's change how we do this because there's only one thing you can control and that's you. You cannot control them and their process. So I like that notion, taking a moment to count one, two, three, you're the one that's really kind of changing your communication style and you're the one that's being patient so that you're leaving room to better understand what your loved one is saying in the ways that they can, if they're still able to verbally give some words or if they're unfortunate at that stage, they're using one word sentences or at the stage of not being able to communicate at all, you're doing the detective work to figure those things out. Moving on to the next slide as we talk uh, about, again, communicating in the middle stages. Again, in connecting with our loved ones, it's important to approach them from the front. You know, imagine if you will, you know, we who are fully functioning are preoccupied reading something and somebody just immediately comes up behind you and taps you on the back. You yourselves are gonna feel a sense of being startled. Imagine if you will, because of dementia or Alzheimer's, which is affecting your ability to process and it's affecting your memory, your thinking, your whole uh, way of just being. Uh, if somebody's coming up behind you, it will startle them, it will frighten them, it might create some agitation. It's also important as you're approaching the loved one from the front to be able to introduce yourself. Hi, love, it's me, it's Michael. How are you doing this evening? That sort of thing. Being able to maintain eye contact, uh, being able maybe even to get at a lower position. You know, if you're standing up over somebody, it could be quite intimidating if, you know, you're up front. Hi, how are you doing? That sort of thing. So being able maybe to get a little lower and look them up in the face, that sort of thing. Again, it's important to avoid criticizing, correcting, or arguing. You know, can I go outside? It's hot outside. It's nighttime. It's nine o'clock. You can't go outside. It's not nighttime. It's not nighttime. Now, what they may be trying to say is um, they want to leave the room because there's some environmental thing. Maybe uh, they want to leave the room because, indeed, it's too dark in there. Uh, and they want to go to a room that has better lighting, that sort of thing. Again, pay attention to your tone. How we communicate will have a major impact and influence on our own loved ones. And again, take your time. As the woman said a few moments ago in the video, count to three before we say or react or do something. Uh, patience on our part is critical. Let's move on to the next step slide. she could sense my frustration because occasionally I would lose my patience and I, I would balk at her. Why are you asking me that question again? I just answered that question two minutes ago. And then she would get frustrated because, you know, she was very old school and she said, don't disrespect me. And I didn't ask you that question two minutes ago. It's a new question. So phase two of our relationship was like, Okay, that's a new question. I'll answer it again. So it's important hearing how Rebecca had to realize, again, her style of communication, how she was engaging with her own parent was really impacting things. As we move on to the next slide, we're going to talk about how it's important to join the person in the middle stages uh, of what's going on with them joining them in their own reality. And what we mean that by this, and let me give you a perfect example, real life example. Uh, as Ms. Keefe said, I'm both a community educator and a support group facilitator. One of our support groups, uh, one of the wives, the spouses of the former Vietnam, is a Vietnam veteran, former combat in Vietnam. And one time they were sitting there watching TV and immediately he starts going, leave me alone, you're gonna hurt me. Get, get away, get away, get away, leave me alone. And initially, she was at the phase of saying, shut up. I'm trying to watch the TV. There's nobody here. Nobody's here to hurt you. Uh, just be quiet, that sort of thing. And uh, over the course of a few weeks, she realized, I need to be respectful. I need to be patient. He is a Vietnam veteran. Maybe he's 
reliving something, a trauma, uh, of being seen or hurt by uh, you know, the enemy, if you will. And so she was eventually be able to say, there, there, sweetheart, it's okay. I'm here in the room. She'd sit next to him. She'd pat him on the shoulder. They're not going to hurt you. I'm here to protect you. So being able to join that reality, if you will. And again, assess the person's needs. If they're not able to tell us, I'm hungry, thirsty, my clothes are a little too tight, I've got indigestion, kind of make those assumptions. Um, and if they can't come up with the right word, being able to, again, detective work, provide a brief answer that gets at maybe what they're trying to say. And again, get at the emotions behind what they're saying. You know, um, they may be by their behavior expressing a sense of frustration and being able to say, it must be frustrating that you can't drive anymore. They're looking out the window and what they're doing, they're looking out the window and looking at their automobile. And maybe what they're saying is, gee, I wish I could drive again, that sort of thing. So being patient, being able to join them in their reality. Let's move on to the next slides. And in connecting with our loved ones, it's important to keep it slow and basic. Again, the importance of using short sentences. Uh, if you're asking them a question, giving them some choices in that question. Don't say, what do you want for dinner? That's wide open. Sometimes we who can still function are like, I don't know what I want for dinner. But you may want to say, what would you like for dinner, sweetheart? Do you want fried chicken? Or I can give you a piece of baked chicken. Would you like a tuna sandwich? Or would you like a ham sandwich? And again, hopefully you're hearing my intonation uh, that I'm speaking slowly, that I'm speaking clearly, that sort of thing. And as we're trying to communicate with our loved ones, keeping distractions to a limit. Uh, you know, we're not in um, the living room, the TV's on, the fan's on. Again, you got guests on, and you're trying to say to your loved one, what do you want for dinner? And all they can process is, is it the TV that they're hearing? Or the noise? And they're, they're looking at you like, what are you saying? Um, or they may even come up with some bizarre word, and you're thinking, I asked you, do you want uh, chicken, what form of chicken, that sort of thing. So turning the sound down on the TV, maybe asking a guest, could you tone down? Uh, again, another example, real life example, one time when my wife was at a daycare program, one of the staff members was trying to ask her something during lunch. And they had my wife sitting at a table with some other uh, clients or participants of the daycare program who were very loud. And so as the staff members trying to ask my wife something and you've got all this noise around you my wife basically said <laughs> as she was at that stage she was irritated uh, and she would use unfortunately curse words so rather than saying i don't understand you or i can't hear you then she used some expletive uh so you know again the importance of being patient that sort of thing okay let's move on to the next slide And when we're relaying uh, information to our loved ones, providing visual cues and gestures. So again, if you're saying, would you like something to drink? Maybe showing them a bottle of water, maybe showing them the actual cup, that sort of thing. Also in communicating, even non-verbally with our loved ones, being able to be very slow and purposeful in our gestures. We're not immediately grabbing them and saying, come on, let's go. You know, again, as I mentioned earlier, that can be quite unsettling and quite startling to do that sort of thing. If they're still able to understand things in terms of written communication, writing things down for the person. So maybe you're writing down on a whiteboard uh, a few simple sentences or word. If you're hungry, apple, and you have it on the counter, that sort of thing. Uh, put your answers into questions. How would you like to go outside? versus what do you want to do right now, you know, that sort of thing. You may have to repeat uh, an instruction or a word because, again, they're not able to process what you're saying at a particular moment. So, you know, being able, again, to be able to be patient. Um, and again, avoid quizzing your loved ones. In other words, quizzing the person, asking him or her to try harder, to remember, you know what today is, you know, you know, come on. You know what's going on, that sort of thing. Try harder. 
And it's not that they can't, what am I trying to say? It's not that they can't remember, and this is some, uh, you know, thing that they're making up. They really have a medical condition. It's a neurodegenerative disease. And so if they're saying, I can't remember, or they can't try to figure out something that maybe they were uh, very efficient in in the past, you know, don't sit up there and say, come on, I know how you can do it. You used to do it. You did it last year. You know, that sort of thing. Again, be patient, be respectful, that sort of thing. Move on to the next slide. The importance, and I shared this earlier, of being empathetic. Again, as I mentioned in the example I shared about one of the group members and her husband who's a veteran, being able to join that person's reality. My late wife would often call out her mother, uh, mom, mom, mom. Uh, her mother had passed away a number of years prior to Bernita getting Alzheimer's. And rather than saying, you know, your mother's not here, sometimes I would actually go and get a picture of her mom and say, here's your mom. Or I would say in a very gentle way, your mom's at peace. She's fine. She's at rest. You know, maybe she'll join us tomorrow. You know, you know, fudging reality, if you will. But again, it's a way of just joining the reality without making them feel embarrassed or, or that sort of thing. Providing reassurance that you're there to hear and understand. Again, focus on the emotions that's underneath and not the facts. Um, they may be, again, lonely, frustrated, that sort of thing. And being able to say, you know, it is frustrating that you can't go out like you used to or that you can't go for a walk if they're now further along in their illness and even the Alzheimer's has affected their ability to walk, uh, that sort of thing. So it's important also to validate and redirect the person if necessary, meaning that, you know, if they're getting frustrated and they can't articulate that frustration, maybe again saying, hey, look, here's a picture. Let's look at the picture again together, that sort of thing. Oh, look, it's it's really pretty outside. So you're redirecting, uh, you know, you're trying to get them to focus on something else, that sort of thing. So let's move on to the next stage. So what happens in the late stages? In the late stages, the person may use a very few words, or they may not use a word at all, uh, but they still need to have a sense of connection. We're not literally sitting there having them by themselves all day long and not even speaking to them, almost as if they're part of the furniture or something. Remember that the person is an adult with a sense of themselves, and it's important to be able to make that connection. And you can connect with those aspects of them uh, by remembering the person's history, maybe even being able to recall some things. Remember when we used to go for a walk? Uh, Bernita, remember when we went up to Pleasantville and met with your aunt and, you know, we would go because Pleasantville is right next to Atlantic City. We'd go up to Atlantic City and go to the casino or we'd go for a show, that sort of thing. Even again, showing them pictures, uh, joining them as is the case here in this picture. You now let's pet the family dog, that sort of thing. It's important that you keep talking with them using familiar words, names, phrases, poems, passages. Uh, for those of us who are religious and spiritually based, reading the Bible, reading prayers, that sort of thing, playing their favorite music. Uh, and so it's important to engage the five senses. And we're going to talk more in depth about those five senses now as we hear from uh, Sandra, who's talking about how she connected with her mother. So let's move on to the next slide. I know that my mom feels aggravated. I know that she feels alone. I know that she feels confused. And I know on any given day, I don't know if I've made it better for her. I try. In these later stages, I've come to recognize that being really aware of the five senses is really important. Touch seems to give her a great deal of comfort. I know when I come over, I'm going to brush her hair all the time. My husband noted to me recently, he said, you know, you should see the look on your mom's face when you're brushing her hair. She's just happy. She's just happy. She doesn't say a lot. And I do it for a long period of time. I comb it, I braid it, I do funny things with it but it just allows me to just be with her in a way that makes her feel comfortable. I love how she shared how combing and touching her mom's hair, uh, touch is one of those five sense, senses that
that can help us connect. The others are sight, sound, smell, taste. And so in terms, and particularly in the late stages, because by the late stages, our loved ones now are not communicating. They're not able to say a single word. Um, and so in terms of touch, um, you know, not only as Sandra mentioned, brushing her mother's hair, one of the things I used to do, combining actually touch and smell, uh, I, she loved lavender. And so I would take lavender lotion and put the lavender lotion on our hands uh, and the home health care aide that would come in while I was at work, you know, we would rub her hands. Uh, and then sometimes she would end up just rubbing our hands back. And so that sense of touch. And, and I would even say, hmm, doesn't that lavender smell nice, Nietzsche? Or I'd get, you know, basil or whatever else. So hand massages, touching hair, that sort of thing. Uh, if you have a pet at home, uh, if there are animals outside, animals that are safe to touch, you know, the neighbor's dog, if they're walking the dog and being able to say, is your dog friendly? It's on a leash, that sort of thing. Using non-toxic materials, maybe some clay that they can play around with, that sort of thing. So it's keeping them engaged. It's keeping the senses going. It's keeping um, their brains, even though their brains are really, really compromised at the late stage, but it's still helping some part of that brain fire those neurons. And so there's some sense of connection, if you will giving back rubs. I know my late wife used to love that. I would, you know, again, touch her on her shoulders and, you know, that that sort of thing. Um, and when she would stand up, I'd do it. And, and I was amazed sometimes how she would, in turn, give me a little hug and, and would give me a back rub, that sort of thing. So touch is important. Moving on to the next slide as we talk about another sense, uh, one of the other sensory things is sight laminate brightly colored pictures to look at together, uh, family albums, photo albums, watching a video of animals, of nature, travel, uh, viewing photos of famous paintings, maybe it's a famous painting that they loved, uh, taking them outside to look at the animals, going bird watching, uh, being able to maybe, even though, again, they may not be able to actually paint correctly, but giving them some safe, non-toxic watercolors to paint with. Again, it's just and being able to say as they're painting, wow, is that a pretty red color? Ooh, you put the red and blue together. Look at that. That's well, that's a gorgeous color, purple. So you're almost describing to what they're doing. Again, that's another way you're communicating, verbalizing, that sort of thing. <clears throat> We're at spring, uh, going outdoors and sitting by an open window together, those sorts of things. That's just another way of uh, connecting. And uh, as we're connecting, talking to them. So they're hearing our voice, they're saying things, we're explaining things to them, so to speak, and that really does help them feel a sense of, again, dignity, a sense of being connected to, even though they're not doing the typical give and take in a conversation as they used to when they were healthy and the disease had not compromised them, particularly now that they're at the late stages and they can't communicate at all. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, my late wife at the late stages of her Alzheimer's, basically she, she was mute, if you will. Um, so just being able to, me doing all the talking and doing the sight and touching and that sort of thing. So let's move on to the next uh, sense. And the next sense is sound and music. Matter of fact, uh, a lot of research has shown that one of the last parts of the brain that shuts down, if you will, as the disease progresses, is sound and so playing their favorite music you know from the 40s or 50s um, that sort of thing believe it or not way back in the 70s after I graduated I was a psychology major and I worked at St. Louis's hospital and was federally owned we did something called psychodrama we would try to get these older women it was a geriatric ward engaged um, but naturally they couldn't for a whole host of reasons and my colleague who would go with me, she played the piano. And so we'd play some uh, music, uh, big band music from the 40s or 50s. And believe it or not, I tried to sing. But it was amazing as we played that music and you would see their faces brighten up. And so playing someone's favorite music, uh, they brighten up. And I've even seen news stories. You'll see this and you'll hear these stories. Somebody may have been sitting for months or weeks because they're at the late stages and they're not being able to communicate. Hey, how are you doing this evening? And all of a sudden you're playing a tune and they're starting to sing. Amazing grace. 
And you're like, wow, I haven't heard mom or dad sing that hymn in a long time. And so, you know, it just touches something. It, that part of the limbic system is still functioning, believe it or not. Um, again, so listening to speeches, songs, reading books, poems, uh, again, just being able to communicate yourself uh, will be able to help, okay? So moving on to the next sound, and then we're moving on to smells. We kind of alluded to this when I mentioned touch and, and using lavender, which is a, a you know nice smell. So herbs and spices, you know, if there's something favorite, uh, rose petals, you know, buying fresh roses, flowers, having them smell it. Uh, again, we're at springtime, if you're outdoors, being able to smell different things, putting different uh, aromas on cotton balls, being dipped in essential oils, that sort of thing. If you're outside, gee, smell the uh, grass. Wow, you want a cup of coffee? Look, this is hazelnut. Doesn't that smell lovely? Uh, using fragrant lotions, lotions, as I mentioned. Uh, if they love cooking, you know, making that apple pie and, you know, mom, remember you used to make that great peach cobbler? Uh, here, I just made some peach cobbler for you. Mm, smell that peach cobbler. Here, let me give you a taste. And then, you know, being able to describe what you're doing. And so they hopefully somewhere in the recesses of how they can process uh, information is understanding that smells good, that tastes good, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, so keep in mind, um, if you're doing anything related to smells, allergies, that sort of thing, that you know, you're not exacerbating any kind of uh, allergies, that sort of thing. So we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, we talked about taste just a few moments ago. Their favorite foods, home-baked goods, popsicles, uh, you know, and even again, describing what the food is uh, as you're doing this. Here's your favorite strawberry cake. I know how you love strawberries. Remember we used to go and pick strawberries at the strawberry patch or if it's fall. Remember mom used to make pumpkin pies, you know, that sort of thing. So you're communicating, you're showing it to them, those sorts of things. So, and you're having them taste it as long as it's not too hot, too cold, uh, and they're enjoying what you're sharing and providing with them. Moving on to the next slide. So being able to understand, kind of putting this all together, uh, regardless of whatever stage is, it's important to join their reality, to connect with, with them as best that you can. Understanding, accepting what you can do and can't do to change them. So again, it's not trying to you know, force them to do something given where they are in the progression of the illness. It's about, again, us making the changes to be where they are and whatever stage of communication that they're at. Remember that the person retains a sense of themselves, and so we still are engaging them as adults. Uh, remember the video, the woman said, you know, even her mother kind of alluded to, you know, uh, I'm the older one, you gotta respect me, that sort of thing. So demonstrating respect. Always treat the person as an adult. Try to decode that person's communications. Recognize the effects of your mood and your actions. So uh, if you're tired or frustrated, you know, go take care of yourselves. And as caregivers, we struggle with anywhere to 30 to 40 percent of depression and anxiety uh, and also 30 to 40 percent of stress. So if we're taking care of ourselves. We can show up in a better mood and better disposition and in better health, actually, to take care of our loved ones. And if we're in a good mood and good health, that's going to be conveyed literally in terms of our own communication style. Oh, yeah, I got to sit with you again. Here, hurry up, eat your food. What do you want? You know, so and again, you can hear that level of frustration or anger. Uh, again, trying to understand the sources of what their reactions might be about. Is it the environment? It's too loud, that sort of thing. Uh, and help meet the needs while soothing the calm and calming the person that you're with. So those are just some tips to be mindful of throughout the process. Moving on to the next slide. It's a video. 
taking care of yourself while you care for somebody with the disease um, not only impacts your own health, but it really can impact the person with the disease. So for example, if you're not getting enough sleep, you might be easily irritated, which will then um, sort of spill over to your interactions with the person with the disease and, and maybe being short with them, which then might cause them to get frustrated. So it's not only important to take care of yourself for your own health, but really for you to really be a good caregiver. So that was Dr. Sam Fazio. He's the Director of Special Projects with Alzheimer's Association. Just reemphasizing what I said. And so wrapping this all up, again, Dementia Fridley America, PG County, as you saw from Ms. Uh, Kiev, she shared a lot of great resources. And the Alzheimer's Association is a partner in those resources. And so we have a 24-7 helpline. It's free. Uh, we have trained counselors that can speak any form of language, believe it or not, Swahili, Hindu, Patu. Um, it doesn't make a difference. Bilingual translation. Uh, you're in the middle of the night. You're feeling frustrated. You, know, you call. Uh, also, if somebody's hearing impaired, uh, we have a TTY service. Uh, we also have a live chat. You can get in and chat with a trained counselor again. I'm experiencing this. My mother is doing this. How do I communicate with her? You know, she threw something across the room. What was that about? Well, maybe your mom was feeling frustrated. And so there's a resource there. So do the 1-800-272-3900 or go to our website, alz.org, and we can provide as many resources as you would like. So now why don't we stop the presentation here uh, and entertain